Hi oh, hey everyone, thanks for joining me today. We're here to talk about ambulance medical review findings. I'll be your presenter. My name is Tom Ryan with Provider Outreach and Education. Today, Aline Ziegler, among other members of my team, is joining me to help with the chat, questions, and technical support. The chat is available for you and that's how we will handle questions. We have a lot of material to get through, but I don't want you to think you can't answer questions. If you did not happen to receive the reminder email, you should have gotten an invite when you actually registered. Um, I sent you another invite and the invite should have been a calendar invite. That calendar invite will contain a link to the material and you can go ahead and download that. If you did not and you're unable to find the PowerPoint, please email us at WPS period GHA period education at WPSIC.com. That is in the chat feature. I'm going to go ahead at this point and start sharing the PowerPoint and we will get through some of the material. So here we go. All right, so let's start with some housekeeping as always. Again, if you do have a chat or a question, we want to make sure we get to those. So we would like you to use that chat feature. Uh, the recording uh, will be added to YouTube as an encore. Now this should be a little different than what we used to do. We've moved it away from the Learning Center. Remember, we are phasing out our Learning Center, so that will be a little bit of a change. So I just want to show you a couple of things real quick related to that, and then we'll get into some of the more material about this particular event. So on our YouTube channel, which again will be linked directly from our website, I'll show you that in a moment, you will be able to move directly to the playlists or directly to the new videos and it will be here. We have no uh, intention of taking this video down so it's not out there for 30 days like our old encores, it will remain out there. The playlist that you're going to want to look at up here under playlists and if we move to that we're going to look for the one labeled ambulance. And the ambulance playlist, of course, is where we're going to find this information. So as we scroll through, you'll see a variety of different ones. Here's ambulance suppliers. It'll be under the medical review cert because we're going to talk about that program. It's going to be under appeals because we're going to hit on that. So you're going to be able to find it in a, a variety of different places. But this ambulance suppliers is your primary location. Okay. So again, to receive credit for this webinar, you must attend the entire webinar. This is important. And what we're going to do is change up the system a little bit. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Learning Center and going out and completing the course in the Learning Center. You don't need to do that. If you're on the webinar, we will automatically send you a follow-up email. This follow-up email will contain information about, um, about the CEUs, where to complete the survey, all of that. That information will automatically be triggered and sent to you directly after the event. So there is no need to do any further actions uh, with that. So that'll be a nice feature for you. You will also be given the opportunity to take a survey and we'll talk more about that. I will take questions following this event for 10 days. The questions must be submitted using the email address. So if you're looking for that, you're going to come to our website and you're going to go to the training center here and then you're going to go to training, underneath the training, you're going to use the live events page. On the live events page, you'll be able to scroll down to the bottom after the list of live events and you'll actually see where to submit your post-submitted questions. This is an important page to make sure that you're aware of. Um, it is how we're going to do things in the future. So it's a little bit different when we talk about some of the 10 days and the, the different items that we used to do. Um, so I wanted to make sure you're aware of that. So let's see. Um, once we are ready to have this advertised as an Encore presentation, you will receive an e-news about that. So that information will be forthcoming to you in an e-news. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide here. And I'm sorry, you're going to see me jump around just a little bit at first. It won't be as bad once I get going. Um, again, the links will all be provided to you in the chat feature, so Alina will give you all of those. So first, what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about ambulance findings, about the medical review programs and where the errors are occurring, the common errors, how we can avoid them, maybe some different steps to help you out. So that's what we're going to look at today. 
uh, our goal is to get you through the medical review process as quickly and easily as possible. So we want to make sure you're going to get all that information. One, we're going to provide you some general information about medical review. One of the issues that we're having is getting people to respond to some of the medical reviewers, so we feel like it's important for you to identify who they are. Another area that we're going to look at is the actual errors and what potential help you can get for them. So what's causing these errors, what's going on with them, and we'll give you the categories that they fall into. Last, as we get through this agenda, we're going to look at some different actions you can take. So you have a medical review, you don't agree with what happened, what can you do about that finding? What can you do to help with that finding? So talk some about that too. So on to the next slide. The first thing we need to talk about are those review entities. Because if you don't know who's even looking at your claims, understanding the documentation, understanding all of the different items isn't going to help you. So a couple things I want you to keep in mind. Medicare uses multiple review entities. Some of them are contractors and some of them are actually from the federal government. This slide does not list one and I'll talk just briefly about it. Um, and there's a reason it's not listed on there. So one of the, again, one of those common questions is, do I have to respond to medical review entities? And the answer is yeah. If you get a request for medical records and you don't respond, you will lose your money or you will not get paid. So respond. Um, you want to respond timely. It's very important. A couple of uh, websites I want you to be aware of when you talk about the medical review entities is on the CMS webpage. There's one called Medicare Fee for Service Compliance Programs. And there's also one called Improper Payment Measures Program. And I'll talk about that, uh, which one goes to which. Let's get started with the MAC, which is actually part of the in, um, which is actually part of the compliance program. So this is who's reviewing your claims. Medicare Administrative Contractor. This is us. And how do we review your claims? We review your claims primarily on a prepayment basis through the targeted probe and educate process or the prior authorization request process for repetitive scheduled non-emergent ambulance transports or ResNet. The reason we say primarily is on occasion CMS will give us a task or an assignment or they'll give us a special project which is outside the normal review guidelines and that process could be a post-pay review. We never really know when those are coming in and those are really hard to address because they each are unique. So we're going to stick to the two primary processes. I'm going to talk a little bit about each one to kind of help you all here. So first, our targeted probe and educate process. This is done with our medical review department. What they do is use data to identify potential providers causing errors or that may have potential errors. Again, it's all data driven. They select these providers and then a nurse contacts them, or I'm sorry, a nurse gets the contact information, sends out a request for 20 to 40 claims to review. They review those claims, they determine if there's findings. If there's no findings, you're automatically passed off, you're good. If there are findings, then that nurse works with the provider, the supplier in this case, the ambulance supplier, to say, here's what we're finding, here's what the problem is, here's what we're going to see, all kinds of different things. Now, you get a certain length of time to correct any of those problems, and then you go through the round again. This will happen up to three rounds. In most cases, by the time someone reaches round three, um, by the end of round three, they've completed it. We're going to talk about what happened with the last round of ambulance review, but we'll talk about that in a little while. So once you reach round three, if you still haven't corrected it, you can be referred to CMS, and CMS will take whatever actions they choose. This is outside of the MAC realm, but we will refer you to CMS. The prior authorization process is exactly what it sounds like. It is before a service occurs. It can provide a provisional affirmation for payment. Again, the medical documentation must still support the payment. Key here, medical documentation must support the payment. So though we will provide you a provisional affirmation, it does not guarantee payment upon review of post-pay. And we'll talk more about a, a contractor that in particular can look at those post-pay review items. So again, Part of the, the prior authorization is repetitive scheduled non-emergent ambulance transports. So it's only for two codes, and it's only for, for items that are you know, scheduled 24 hours more in advance, more than one time. A lot of people use this for dialysis or chemo. 
Those are two common areas where you're going to see this information um, happening. If you want more information on that, take a look at our website. I'll just throw a link out there for you. Hopefully that'll help you get to that. It's the medical review section of our website, and we have a lot of information on both CPE and the, um, the ResNet program, the prior authorization program. Let's talk about the next contractor. This is the comprehensive error rate testing contractor. Now their job is a slightly different than ours. Their job is to look at the improper payment error rates. They want to measure the improper payments. They want to um, put a certain amount out there. What the, their job is is to go back to not only CMS but other parts of the federal government, which could include Congress. They supply a report that says, here's what we see. Here's our percentage of the review findings. And by the way, that X makes out too. I'll show you more of um, those findings for 2021 coming up later. So if they select your sample of claims, it is random. So it's a stratified random sample. It means they look at certain things. And yes, you need to respond. All of their information is available on the CMS website. You want to take a look at that. If there's information or something you need from them, you're going to have to go directly to them. If you send something to us and they've requested it, we won't know what to do with it. So we don't know that you've got a finding until after you get a finding. If you don't get a finding, then we will have a tool on our website you can use for that. All right. So that's a different type of part of that program that we talked about. Part of the compliance program, if we're going to move back to that, is with the Recovery Audit Contractor, or RAC. This is part of the Recovery Audit Program. A lot of people have heard of the RAC. And what this program is, is it's a way to make sure that claims are paid correctly. It's all post-pay review. They can do a complex review, which, by the way, means a nurse has to review it or someone has to look at it. Or they can do an automated or an edit review. Now, an edit review is a little different. There's no, there's no person ever looking at it. It just says, hey, did this meet this criteria based on this within the system? And if it didn't, they take the money back. So they have two different types of reviews. The recovery audit contractor has to have everything approved. Everything. So again, there's going to be a website, a CMS website for, that, for this um, program. But along with that, each RAC has their own website. And you can submit documentation and things to them on their website. What types of things are the RACs looking for today as it relates to ambulance? One, they're looking at both air and ground, emergency and non-emergency, medical necessity, and documentation. So they're reviewing these on a complex basis. This means that, again, it is a nurse or someone qualified to do that. They're looking at transfers between skilled nursing facilities. This is the end-to-end -end transfer um, on your origin and destination modifier. This is an automated review. We just want to make sure, you know, hey, if they went to a skilled nursing facility from a skilled nursing facility, you're not getting paid when you shouldn't be. They're also looking at transports during an inpatient stay. Again, this is an automated review. The reason that they're looking at this is the transport typically comes in before the inpatient claim comes in. So sometimes the system doesn't catch this, and so they want to make sure that we're not paying these incorrectly. And the last one that they're actually looking for is ambulance services related to SNF consolidated billing. So it's when it's a related service to something the SNF should be responsible for. So they have four different active ambulance reviews going on right now. And you could get you know, any of those, automated or complex, and you could get requests for any of that information. So it's important to make sure you're aware of that. Let's move on to the next one. Again, this is going to be part of that, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the compliance program. And this is a supplemental medical review contractor. So, supplemental medical review contractor, every once in a while, You'll hear someone refer to this as a special projects contractor or um, you know, CMS only gives them certain things, and that's actually a correct statement. This contractor is assigned a topic by CMS. They work with CMS to establish how they're going to do that topic, whatever that is. You know, we've seen things from, hey, you want to look at, hey, a new technology and how's that working, whether or not something's happening there. We want to look at a benefit and maybe determine whether or not there's a better payment system that needs to happen. There's a variety of different things the SMRC can do. But again, they're all assigned by CMS. We don't have a lot of details. Um, 
we're not just we're just not giving the details on this because it doesn't really um, help us so much. So we have to wait until something happens with them and whether or not they make that decision. Um, the SMRC can do a complex review and they can do an automated review. It just depends on what's assigned to them. The last one I want to talk the last one that I want to mention um, is the Office of Inspector General. Now the Office of Inspector General is a little bit different than all the other contractors above. Again, contractors above, Office of Inspector General. They are part of the Department of Health and Human Services. They are tasked with looking at everything under the Department of Health and Human Services to make sure it's being paid correctly and we're protecting the federal money. So some people refer to them as a legal watchdog or a way of making sure all those different things happen. That's great. Each year, the OIG does publish a work plan. That work plan does contain an ambulance review, and I'll show you that later. But remember, they're going to publish reports that go out to different portions of the federal government. They're going to look at different things differently, and they're going to give recommendations for how to maybe alleviate or how to look at these different items a little differently. The one that isn't on here, and there is a reason for it, is the Unified Program Integrity Contractor, otherwise known as a UPIC, P-I-C. And that one is a fraud and abuse investigation. Um, it is part of the review program, but it's very specialized. And you have to be referred to them from CMS and a lot of other steps because it is a fraud and abuse. So they're looking at whether or not you're committing fraud and abuse. Their process is a little different. Um, and I don't want to really address that during the general medical review findings because we don't get review findings from them and we don't see them either. That's not part of what this would be. But I do want you to be aware that they they do exist. All right, next, what's key? Well, if we're looking at medical review, there's some key things we have to have, and that's the documentation. So I want to let you know that we do offer an article on our website. It's called Ambulance Documentation Requirements. This um, article provides you with all the information I'm going to give, lots more detail. Um, it'll help drive you to it. So when we look at the documentation, what we're trying to do is actually support a statement in the Social Security um, law. And that statement says that the service has to be for a um, transport that is contraindicated. Two key things. has to be a transport, not transport, not payable, and you have to prove that the service was medically necessary for, I'm sorry, and you have to prove that the service was required for the patient's condition today. So it's not just about, hey, it was ordered. Was it today required? That brings us back to ResNet. And remember that that uh, provisional affirmation? Well, if we can give you a provisional affirmation and it goes out 60 days, something could have changed within that time frame, which is why the CERT reviewer can still look at those claims, even though you've got a provisional affirmation. So lots of different things to think about. So. As we highlight medical review, we have to talk about what has to be in the documentation. Because without it, you're automatically lost. First, tell us who the patient is. This seems real basic, but a lot of times we'll get information if we can't identify the patient. And this isn't just by name. This means name, date of birth, um, identify other identifying factors. Key things to keep in mind with name. If the patient goes by a nickname, Tom versus Thomas, uh, that one's pretty pretty clear, but you want to make sure it's you know identified clearly in there. Maybe Elizabeth is Betty. Okay, is that matching the system? And you you can check that in the system. So you want to make sure you're matching that. Date of births are sometimes wrong, and that becomes a problematic issue for us because we can't process a claim with an incorrect date of birth on it. Along with that, we also need the EMT information. Now that makes sense. Do I need the driver's information? Nope. But if the driver at any point did part of the evaluation, part of the service, then I do. So each EMT treating must sign the documentation. They have to attest that this is what they did, that this documentation supports. And by doing that, that's the signature requirement. Now, don't forget that the patient also has to sign. And that's one of the common elements that we get hit on. Insufficient documentation, because there's no patient signature. So the patient has to authorize you to bill Medicare. If they don't, then it's the patient responsibility. The next element is the when, which is just directly underneath that. That's really your date and time. And this should include the date of the service if it's two different dates. So if your service transport over midnight, 
make sure you have both of them. When you go to bill it, you're going to want to use the start date, and you're going to want to bill appropriately. Date and time. Time should be pickup time. Time should be transport time, when you actually started physically moving them. And then when you, you gave up, relinquished control to the facility or wherever you're taking that transport to. And that, that could be a patient's residence as well. We just, uh, we just need to know that start and stop sign. Next comes to the big one. And this is actually going to jump across. And we're going to go with why. Why was the ambulance transport the only safe means for that patient today? So during that date and time that you have documented, why was this the safest means or the only safe means? This includes what are the EMT skills that were required? Medical training skills. Well, what if they don't need medical skills? They need monitoring. Well, why do they need monitoring? What makes this monitoring required? What other types of prevention or other things make it so you can't load them into or that their family couldn't transport them or so whatever the situation is. This is one of the key things that is causing us medical review denials today. And I'll explain more about these examples in just a few slides as we get into some of the different examples. Also, what happened? We get some run reports that are very bad. They don't really tell us what the EMT did. Now, I want to remind you that when I say EMT, Medicare defines that as a basic, intermediate, or a paramedic. That's all three. So when you look at the different information, you want to make sure everything is put together in that manner. So then, um, once you get that run sheet, it's all good. You, you actually have to provide us with a point of pickup and a point of drop off. That's one of the key elements. The point of pickup, zip code, is very important. And some people say, well, I don't have one because it was an accident. Come up with the best one you can. But this drives a lot of payment factors, like um, the adjustments for uh, rural, urban, and super rural. All of those are all based on this particular zip code that you're going to put on the claim. So when you look at this, there is one thing I want everyone to be aware of. If you bill on a UB04 and your point of pickup, so you're doing two transports on the same day, are different, you must bill the first one for the first time in with the correct zip code and the condition or um, the occurrence code telling us that this is the point of pickup. Once that processes, then you build a second one in. And you can change that, like if you have to pick them up at the hospital and now you're going to transport to another hospital or you're going to pick them up at a freestanding ER and transport to another hospital. So you want to build them in chronological order. Always keep them in chronological order. Um, this helps us and helps you track what's going on with it. Also, within the documentation, we need to know how far you transported them. This is a happening a few different times. And one of the medical review errors that's happening with this is, while well, you're transporting them 27 miles, this is the exact example. You're transporting them 27 miles. OK, the nearest appropriate facility was 14 miles. So therefore, there's 13 miles that you went beyond that facility. In Medicare's world, those 13 miles should not be payable. They're billed with a separate code. This was ground, so A0425, 14, 13, A0888. Sounds great. When it was billed, it was billed with an A0425 with total mileage and an A0888 with 13. So this told us that this is a lot more mileage than what happened. So when we went back to the documentation, we were assigned it, or we assigned a mileage error on this because it's not documented in that manner. It's not that it wasn't documented at all. It's just that it wasn't documented. It wasn't coded correctly. Um, so. There's a variety of different things that happen when you look at that. So you want to make sure that that mileage documentation is also put into there. All right. So what happens and what types of errors can we assign to you? The first one is insufficient documentation. This one is one we talked about a little bit there. You didn't give us a patient signature. Uh, maybe you didn't give us a physician certification statement or something that's medical something that's required to support the documentation. On a few slides, I'll talk more about that. Medical necessity, we'll talk about that one in just a few slides. Incorrect coding, I talked about that one with the A0888 and the A0425 example. 
no documentation, and other. We'll talk about these each a little bit. So let's take a look at these, maybe with a few examples to help you understand a bit more about what's going on. So the examples are actual things that contained within documentation that we did not get. So if you look at the slide and what is insufficient documentation, it's not that you didn't respond. It's not that we didn't receive documentation. It's that one of those key elements is completely missing. Without that key element, it is not a payable service. So when we went to back, uh, also if a key element is missing, we won't review it. You get an insufficient documentation error. Why? Well, if we can't look at it and we can't determine what happened in some cases or that you should have been able to bill it, then we aren't going to do the full medical necessity review. So that would be a missing signature. If the patient didn't authorize you to bill Medicare for that service, then guess what? You can't bill Medicare. So why do I need to medically review something that shouldn't have been billed in the first place? That is actually one of the common ones. Now there are criteria for Medicare that would allow in an emergency situation for someone else to sign on behalf of the patient, and that's fine. You want to make sure you follow those. The key with that is if you have that happening, submit them. Missing PCS or a physician certification statement. A lot of people think of this as your ambulance order. These are not required for all ambulance transports, but they are required for scheduled ambulance transports. Um, sometimes they're required to be signed by a doctor, a medical professional, could sign on other situations. But if we don't have one and we need it, you will automatically have to um, give you an insufficient documentation here. One of my favorites that we got was no run sheet. I'm not really sure how you supported billing us in the first place if you don't even know or if you can't even prove what happened during the transport. Now it could have been a simple clerical error and you know just an oversight. We'll talk about what happens if that does happen and how to fix that. Last, uh, missing dispatch reason. We were dispatched because the doctor said so. Okay. Once you got there, what, what did you find out? What did you go on? So you were dispatched because the doctor asked you to come to do a transport. I get that. But help us understand a little bit more about that dispatch once you get there. Because you should have an evaluation once the patient is there. And you should have a second patient complaint. So if the dispatch reason isn't there, doesn't have the patient complaint, we still need an on-scene complaint then. We need to know what's going on with that patient. So those are some insufficient documentation um, items that we've seen. Let's talk about medical necessity. Medical necessity is one that you have to prove because in the Social Security Act, it actually states contraindicated, which means that if it's not medically necessary, it's not a Medicare benefit. Different than some of the other ones. This one says not medically necessary, not Medicare payable. Okay, so the first one we got was a bed confined patient, and that's literally the reason for transport. Well, why are they bed confined? Just because they're bed confined, could they sit? Could they move around? Um, did they need a two-person lift? How, what does bed confined mean? Were they at a point where you know monitoring had to occur? Which, okay, maybe they had breathing difficulties. We don't know any of that. The reason for transport was bed confinement. Okay, when we looked at what occurred during the the um, transport, the patient was stable. There was nothing going on. So bed confinement alone, not good enough got to give us some more information. A lot of times we'll get monitoring, and monitoring of oxygen is a big one. Many patients live on oxygen every day. They you know, have their oxygens with them, they carry around their portables, they have whatever they need to do and they live on oxygen. So why is monitoring required today? What's going on with that patient? It's not just that you're needing monitoring. It's more what's going on with that patient that the monitoring is required. Because you may not have to do an intervention or you may not have to do an action during that time, but if we don't know what it is, then we don't have any idea. Um, restraints or concerns. So this is one that we got and it was very interesting. The patient um, was restrained. We understand they were restrained. They were restrained, but we had no idea why they were restrained. That doesn't really help us understand or be able to move through the action. You know, did you have to restrain them because they kept attacking you? Did you have to restrain them because at the house they were so hostile that did you have to contain them because there's a concern over drug abuse, which is making them react this way? 
So just because they're restrained doesn't mean that it necessarily requires an ambulance transport. Could a police officer restrain someone and take them to the hospital in the back of a car? Yes, that can happen. It happens all the time. So when we look at restraints, we have to understand the need for the EMT to be involved. And again, it could be monitoring, but once you put monitoring, now we need to know why you're monitoring. The other uh, medical necessity one that we got is the evaluation straight up doesn't show the need for the medical skills. We have no idea why this EMT was involved, whether uh, this particular one was a um, middle level EMT, EMTI, and we don't, we don't know. Uh, Okay, so yep, you arrived on scene, you were told by the doctor that you're transporting them, and that's it. And so you put them in, you took them where the doctor told you to take them, which was a skilled nursing facility, but there was no documentation as to what you did, why you did what you did. Uh, the evaluation was missing, like the actual you know, on-scene evaluation. So medical necessity is one of our biggest errors and problems to date. Okay. Sorry, I got stuck for a second here. Incorrect coding. This one is a little different, and this one says the service is medically necessary, only not at the level you coded it. So you may have coded an ALS-2 without an ALS-2 intervention. You may have coded a specialty care transport, but it doesn't meet the criteria. The one that we have in this example was the facility was not where they came from. It wasn't a facility to facility transport, but it was coded as specialty care. No one's arguing that they were critically ill or injured. That's fine, they came from an accident, but that still doesn't need a specialty care transport because that one is specifically for facility to facility. Um, the ALS assessment wasn't completed. So the example in this one was that an EMT basic did the assessment. There was never another assessment. There was no mention of any um, anyone above that level. So whether it's a paramedic or an immediate, they didn't do anything. We have no fact that they were even on scene or that they were on site. Well, without that, that's not an assessment. It's automatically a BLS level because that's the only level the state allows them to perform. Also, this one hits up with air when Brown would have sufficed. So the example with this one was the patient was ordered to be transported by fixed wing air. This is what the doctor wanted. Okay. When they went to look at it, the amount of time to get the patient, first of all, from the hospital to the airport, airport to the next airport, and then back to the hospital was quite a length of time, it's about two hours, but that didn't account for the fixed wing arriving at the airport and a variety of other things. So it's a very different um, informational availability on that. Now I want to tell you that when we look at these incorrect coding, one of the areas that we look at is in the internet only manuals, and we'll give you a couple links to those a little bit later, but those manuals are what we have to look at. Now they are the Medicare Claims Processing Manual and the Medicare Benefits and Policy Manual. These two manuals drive really you know, some of the different information, especially ALS too, because it's very specifically listed in there. Same thing with specialty care transport. If you go into the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, one of the sections actually has that information in there and it defines it and tells us what has to be there and that's what we use. So, um, Aline, if, if you have those links, you can put them out there. If not, we'll get them for you in a little bit. No documentation. Um, okay, this is exactly what it sounds like, so I'm not really sure. You didn't return documentation. One of the other ones was it was built for the incorrect patient. Documentation is returned, but it wasn't for that data service or there was a letter from the provider stating they don't have documentation. So you responded, but you straight out told us, hey, we don't have anything. Well, this is automatically going to cause an error. There's no way around that. It's no documentation. Other. Um, this is my favorite category because this is just a catch-all category. It's not used that often, especially for ambulance. You guys don't really fall into this one. But if anything, anything does not fit into a different category, this is what it's called. So again, not often they used. Actually, in a lot of the reports, you won't even see it for ambulance. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about what actually we're finding. So we've talked about some of the errors. What do you have to do? One, make sure the documentation is complete. Two, make sure it's legible. Three, make sure everything is included. Four, make sure that you respond timely. So all of those different things are very 
on. Very important. Remember, it has to be medically necessary. This can't be a state definition of medical necessity. This can't be a required transport. That was actually an error that we got. Um, the local county said, oh, this patient has COVID. We require you to transport this. However, the wife had brought the patient in, the spouse had brought the patient in. So they had already been exposed. So now we're exposing extra people, the EMTs, when this patient had a fairly stable breathing pattern, had a variety of different things going on, but they weren't unstable at the time of transport. They actually could have gone in a car. This is not medically necessary, even though the state local protocols, state and local protocols required it. So we want to look at that. Um, so one of the things that happened with this particular TPE, and now remember, this is the targeted probe and educate. We start with data analysis. We look at the providers that are potentially causing these errors. And we look at this and we say, okay, we selected 50 providers. These are the highest providers that have the potential to cause this error. We start with round one. And round one, again, is that first 40, uh, 20 to 40 claim review. We look at it. Hey, is it good? We're going to release you. Is, is it not? We're going to do some education. We'll meet around two. So 28 of those providers did move to round two. Now that is a significant reduction. It's almost 50%. So that's, that's a nice solid starting point for us. Um, when we look at this particular information, we move on a little bit more. And we know that from 28 on round two, seven moved on to round three. That's not so bad. That's, that's good. And only one provider did not make the changes. Now keep in mind, some of the providers that just took a little bit longer to get their staff trained and to implement those changes more than it did, you know, to, to give them the training. They understood, they, they knew it, but they still had to reach out to their staff. We understand that and that's why there's three rounds versus one round and then you're automatically referred. So we saw progress throughout this process for the rounds and it was a great um, great information. So Let's move on from there. Um, so what was causing these errors? Uh, one, it's not medically necessary. That was number one. Number two is incorrect coding. Mileage build is covered, but it's not covered. And that's what I talked about a little bit, little bit, a little bit ago. And then transport beyond the nearest appropriate facility. This is one that we're still looking at. So you know, if you're familiar with our locality rule, it's five miles. We'll look, we'll look at that. We're going to use that. We'll look further into that. But Medicare does require you to go to the nearest appropriate facility. This does not consider the patient preference. This does not consider a provider preference or anything like that. So even if a doctor orders a transport to a certain location, we're okay with the transport occurring to that location. We're not always okay with paying all of the mileage for that transport. And that's what this one means. It's a very common TPE error. So CERT is next, and they're the improper payment data. Remember we talked about this one? It's that contractor that they're going to look at things post-pay review. They want to make sure everything processed correctly. And then they create a big report that goes off to a lot of different people. So in 2021, the ambulance portion of the improper payment was seven, or I'm sorry, the ambulance portion alone of the reviewed ambulance claims, it was 7.9% improper payments. So this doesn't count the overall error rate. We're not looking at any of that. So then what happens is of that 7.9%, they enter it into, I call it a magic formula. Uh, for those of you that are statisticians, it is a formula in which creates um, this number that, you know, here's what speculated or um, is a projected error rate. In this case, it was $405 million. This is what's reported back. Now reported back again, Congress gets this report, you know, uh, the presidential office, the legislative branches get it, so the executive office get it. Department of Health and Human Services, all of those different uh, different departments will get this. When they looked at this, and we don't necessarily know all of the different errors that they get. We do see a snapshot of them, but we don't necessarily see all of them. We know that insufficient documentation, again, accounted for 56.6% um, of that 7.9%. Medical necessity was 31.3. Incorrect coding was 6.7. And no documentation was 5.4. So before we leave this, I just want to point out that over 80% of the errors are in the first two categories. So we do get the documentation back. This is actually a very common snapshot. Um, well, do, well, I know documentation error does occur. It's just not as frequently. 
So over 80% are the first two insufficient or not medically necessary. The OIG work plan, this one is, again, a little different. This is one where the OIG identifies vulnerabilities, and then they tell you what they're going to do. Um, the OIG work plan is available on their website. Uh, you don't want to have to, you know, try to get a link to it, or you don't want to have to try to select something. If you go into a search engine and you type OIG work plan, it'll pull up. The work plan then provides you with additional information. So it's going to give you, hey, this is what we're reviewing, and it's going to have a little summary. Actually, let me uh, just open that up for you. Um, sorry, I can't get to the website because of the control here. All right. Okay, so let me... There we go. So I apologize. I uh, had a little bit of trouble there just getting to the website. You'll come to the work plan page. I always recommend um, if you want to look at you know anything going on, you can look at recently active or, or um, active. Now, again, we don't have anything ambulance related that was recently added, but we do have some different stuff that is on the work plan. And so if you just type the word ambulance, there's a category for it. So you don't have to go through the whole process of trying to determine. Now the category um, here, we have two different ones that they're looking for. One of the other ones that goes into it, you saw I got ambulatory surgery. If I just kept going, I would have the ambulance review. Um, I can select the title, and by doing that, it'll explain what they're looking for. And then it'll tell me, is there a finalized report or an in-progress report? The, the ones that are the Ws, these are in-progress reports, so they don't have anything yet. The other ones are finalized reports, and you can actually look at the finalized report that was submitted and what happened with those. So the OIG work plan is important to be aware of. Again, they are a federal entity. They're looking at things a little differently than we do. So we want to make sure everyone is quite aware of that. All right. Okay, so we're going to move on for just a moment, and we're going to talk about some of these actions you can do. So the key thing to remember is there are different actions based on the finding, based on who creates the finding. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But overall, I want to cover the basic actions, the ones that are um, available for you on all findings. So remember, medically necessary, key, key, key. Documentation, ultimate, needs to be done. If you're not familiar with documentation requirements, look at the article that Aline stuck in the chat feature for you so that you get that documentation requirement. Also, if you don't agree, you don't have to just say, yep, okay, Medicare, take your money back. You want to take an action. You want to tell us, hey, I don't agree with this. Now, sometimes the agreement is quite simple, like, oops, I forgot the physician certification statement, so here's the additional documentation, and that's okay too. Sometimes it's more complex and you're saying, our doctor is stating our, our um, EMT is stating it was medically necessary for this reason. One thing I want to tell you when you look at actions on findings, if you're submitting a report at what happens for what happened at the destination, it's not normally something we can consider. Here's why. Did the EMT know or were they involved in that information while the transport occurred? So when we look at all of these different items, we're like, wait, this doesn't work. So you transport someone from the hospital, or I'm sorry, to the hospital from a residence, okay? And then you submit the inpatient report or you submit the emergency room report. That's not what the EMT knew. How did they act on that? What they knew is what we have to consider. So I want to make sure you're at least aware of that. Now, there are times when some of them will work. Let's say they're leading the ER, so you've got an ER report and they know what's going on and that's part of what they base their evaluation on. Yeah, you want to submit that then. Little different situation just depends on what's going on. Leaving a skilled nursing facility, and as they go to the ER, the nurse says, here's my history, here's my this, here's my that. The patient's not able to communicate because they're in pain. Great. We've got that information. Always remember, skilled nursing facility, ER, separately billable run, separately billable. Never bill that to the SNET. That always goes to Medicare Part B. So you want to make sure you get that bill, whether it's on the UV, you know, the A37I, however you bill, make sure it gets billed to Part B. So again, let's jump back to these actions and what you can do. So first, 
you can always say, hey, I agree with what your finding is. I, I don't have a disagreement. This is returning the money. Don't return the money until we ask you for it. So if you get a letter saying, we have a finding, because different medical review contractors will do that. Oh, the recovery audit contractor does this. Then wait, because once they're done, everything that they're done, they notify us, the affiliated contractor, the MAC, and say, take the money back. Wait until you get that, um, that take back, that overpayment request, because that's when you want to give it back to us so we can get everything closed appropriately. Some providers send it to us in advance. They attach a copy of this. We haven't opened the file yet. Now we have to open the file, try to close the file, and track everything together. Always better. Give it a moment. Wait until it happens. One other thing is, let's say that you do agree with the finding, and this does occur. There is something that you can do, and it's saying, I agree with your finding, only I can't afford to pay this back right now. This is an extended repayment schedule, and it allows you to extend the time frame in which you're going to give us the money back. So you do have to supply that to us. It's really great to look at this. We want to make sure you get that as an opportunity, but it doesn't mean you disagree with the finding. The finding stands. It's just that if you took all the money back today, it would be a financial burden. Um, another option is to send a rebuttal statement. Um, now, this is one that's on our website. It's not an appeal. It is a rebuttal statement. Here's what it does. The rebuttal statement allows you to say, I don't agree with it because. But I want you to keep in mind, it's not an appealable decision if you disagree with this rebuttal statement. So as we talk about the appeals, which will be your next action, you have different levels. Rebuttal doesn't offer this. So it's really your, your choice. Simple rebuttal statement, again, it's so that you can come back and say, I don't agree with this decision. You can justify it. Um, some people use a rebuttal statement to the MAC, to us, to supply that missing documentation, to supply that you know physician certification that was missing or something like that. And those are OK, too. All right, that's a rebuttal statement. Uh, I will recommend that if you are looking for this information, please go up to the website, our website, take a look at it. It's very important that it has to be completed accurately and correctly. If you do not submit the rebuttal statement correctly with all the required information, it's automatically considered invalid. Again, remember, you only have a short period of time to do this, so you want to make sure you get this done. Um, as it says, it's 15 days. All right. What happens if you don't agree at all? You just, nope. Mm -mm. You do have the right to do an appeal. Now, an appeal is one that works with medical necessity frequently. You can highlight different things. You can write letters. You can show different pieces of information. You can do different things to help us understand why you feel this is medically necessary. So first, the Medicare Administrative Contractor does a level one appeal. Key thing to remember between these two, our MR team, prepayment, postpayment MR team is never allowed to look at the appeal. That team is a separate division or area within our division. They have their own nurses, they have their own staff, they have a variety of other. So those two cannot cross. And that makes a big difference when you look at it as an independent review. If you don't agree with us or we uphold your decision, maybe we partially uphold, whatever the situation is, you can continue down through all five levels of appeal. If you want to learn more about this, uh, we want to take a look at our website in the appeal section and the CMS website in the appeal section. And we're going to look a little bit more at those in just a few moments. So what are some of the resources that we've talked about and how do you find them? Let's jump back over to the website for just a moment here. The first one we've talked a lot about is this website and this is our website go back to the home page. So key things on this website, if you go to the topic center and you go to claims, I always just recommend instead of trying to scroll through and find what you're looking for, go ahead and either use the alphabet one, which is the second tab here, or type it in. What do we got for ambulance? Oh, okay, here's what we have. One ambulance requirements is an overall article that's going to go through everything I went through, plus billing requirements, um, coding requirements, all of those different things you need to know. It'll go through even the modifiers. 
Um, if you want to know about the documentation requirements, that's under documentation. That is the article that I talked about when I talked about the who, what, when, where, why slide. So this one is really important, and it is broken down by different things you need. Some of them are just basic documentation requirements. I, you know, I need some patient information or, or whatever you want to look at there. Um, there are a variety of other articles that will be in the claims area. Now remember, claims area contains information when you document or before the claim actually happens, and then a little bit different than the medical review portion. So let's move to that for just a couple of moments here. And you're going to see the training section. Oh, I'm sorry. The medical review section up here. So the medical review section, you can look up and how do you respond, what is the TPE process, remember I told you you can learn more about that. Um, the ambulance review is a Part B review because most ambulance services are billed on the Part B claim form, which is the 1500 or 837P electronic. Not saying Part A couldn't be reviewed, but in our case we're looking at the Part B, so I'm just going to move over there. And if I scroll down, you'll see a variety of different ones, but under the targeted probe and educate header, you'll see the first one is the ALS. And if you want to learn more about that, definitely take a look at that. The prior authorization process information is also here from us. So there's a lot of additional information that you can get um, on the processes. If you want to learn about the RAC, if you want to learn about the CERT, if you want to learn about a variety of other things, you can do that. One thing I want to encourage you with is with the CERT error rate. When you come in and you scroll through, you'll look at a variety of different types of errors that are posted. Um, not always will ambulance be on here. Now, this makes sense because remember it was a, a stratified random sample. So maybe during that particular time it wasn't on there at all so we didn't have any ambulance claims. Maybe the next time we will. We don't really know. So you want to look at that. These resources were developed based on what the um, what the CERT contractor is actually finding. So if you don't see one for ambulance, you're okay. I do want to bring you to the CERT lookup tool. One lookup tool. Why is this important? If the CERT doesn't have a finding, then you won't get a letter back. You won't know that what happened. And sometimes you're like, I don't know what happened here. What's going on? If you keep that CERT identification number that's on your letter, you can actually enter it into this tool, and we will help you know what's going on with yours. Is it closed because there was no finding? Are they still in review? Was something else going on? And that's what this will explain to you. So definitely recommend taking a look at that. Jump back a second here. So if you want to take a look at any of that information, great information to have. We've already looked at the OIG website. Let's jump to CMS for just a few moments here. A couple of things I want to point out on the CMS resources. First, what we do, what you do, and the day-to-day -day operating instructions are on this website. These are CMS day-to-day -day operating instructions to the provider and to the contractors. So we're going to go to regulations and guidance. We're going to go to the manuals. A lot of you have seen me use this before, lots of times. Once you come into the manuals, you'll go in, and you can select. The two that I do recommend, especially for ambulance, is the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual and the Medicare Claims Processing Manual. So if we go into the Policy Manual, there is a whole chapter based in ambulance. This is where those definitions for SCT that people are missing, they're critically critically ill or injured or um, it has to be facility to facility are coming from. This is what we have to follow. Along with that, there are specific billing requirements for ambulance and those are in the claims processing manual. So when we go to chapter 15, which again, all about ambulance, all about ambulance, we find out a lot of information. This is not um, about just one type of ambulance bill. Now types of ambulance bill would be on the UV04 837i or the 1500 837 P's. It, it does cover in different information. You can see here's your general guidelines, system specific guidelines. So you want to make sure you hit those up and you are correctly using those. So if you're looking for information, you want to make sure it's here. But I want to point out one other section in chapter 15. See where it says 20.5 documentation requirements? This means that there are certain things CMS has to have and we have to be able to look at. If they're not there, you will automatically fail the, ad, uh, the audit. Done, medical review done, you get a finding. So lots of information interesting on this website. 
Let's go back for a second, and we're going to move to the Medicare tab right up here. Um, I guess before we do that, I want to move to the Research Statistics tab. And the reason that I want to move here is I mentioned the improper payment measurements and the Medicare fee-for-service compliance programs. You can see they're both under the monitoring programs in the left area of the body. Um, so if you want to take a look at any of those, you can then use the left navigation to look at all the different things that we do um, for Medicare and the different contractors that are affected. So it's just good information to know where it's at, uh, especially the recovery audit contractor one, which is the second link. And I recommend this one because it does have their approved topics list. So when we look out and we say, hey, what are they looking at? You can go to the approved topics list and you can filter for ambulance. When you filter for ambulance, you can see here's what they're looking at. A couple of key things. Ambulance does go with laboratory in terms of a category, so they might not be applicable. Other areas you might want to be aware of. First of all, there's a lot of general information under Medicare. You're going to take a look at all of it. A lot of people ask me about AVNs. That's under the beneficiary notice initiatives. Not commonly used for an ambulance provider because they're used only when a service is provided above the level needed for the medical necessity. So air when ground would suffice. That would be an ABN situation. Very rarely are they used otherwise. But this is where you'll find that information. Again, Beneficiary Notice Initiative. However, I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom of this page. The reason I'm going to do that is I want to come to this Provider Type section, and I want to show you the Ambulance Service Center. This is one of your key resources when you're looking for information from CMS, because this is information that is guidance so while our day-to-day -day operating rules were in the regulations and guidance, there's different guidances provided on here in order to help make it a little bit easier. And some of them are linked to the laws or the Code of Federal Regulations, which is the interpretation of the law. So really important that you're aware of these pieces of information. You can see here's a link out to the Federal Register, Code of Federal Regulations, Federal Registers. Um, if you want to know more about the ground ambulance data collection, out of contact, but as I keep going down, you'll just see various pieces of information until you reach the important links. Here's the ambulance fee schedule, public use files. The public use files are what tell us if we have to give you a rural, urban, or super rural bonus. It's so very important there. So lots going on with this. I do recommend take a look at this, you know, get familiar with it. It's really going to be a key to helping you avoid these medical review errors because you're going to understand what CMS wants from you and from us and from every other contractor available. Okay. Let's go ahead and leave that. And what we're going to do now is jump back to the PowerPoint for just a moment. So there's been a lot of questions submitted, and I, um, I'm hoping Aline was able to answer those. I get a little pop-up box telling me there was something submitted, but I can't see what they were. If not, we will address questions. Again, I want to remind you that if you do have a question following this event, we do have 10 days to take those in. Oops, wrong website, I apologize. We do have 10 days to take those in, and you want to follow the directions in the training area of our website. And again, it's training, live events, scroll down below the list of live events, and you will see the post events questions. So if there's a resource that you'd like us to look for, maybe you need more information on something, follow up with those. Very important. Um, once we close, we're going to offer you a survey. You may notice that we do a lot of different surveys. Here's one right here on our website. And each survey then looks at different portions of what we do. This event is surveyed, gauging whether or not you've got good information, how I did as a presenter, what was my flow like, did you like it? This um, link is in the the content, or I'm sorry, in the chat feature, but it'll also pop up on a little pop-up box once I close out of the event. That box will say, hey, do you want to be moved to a new website? Your, your host wants you to go here. It's just the survey. So you can go ahead and take that. If you're going to give feedback on this event, don't come out to the website and take the website survey. Not the appropriate survey for this event. Um, want to make sure we take the survey one. Also in the follow-up email, you'll get that link to the survey. It's really important to make sure you use that. All right, I have one minute to finish up. So that's it for this event. I did get through everything. What happens next for you? Here's what's going to happen next. You will get an email in about an hour or so from WebEx. 
that email on the bottom will say certificate of achievement and will give you your contact hours, which is one hour for this event. You can keep that. You don't need to go to the Learning Center. However, you could go to the Learning Center and complete the event in there. The reason that this one is a little unique and still has a Learning Center and, and, and this other way is because it's a transition event. It's one that's occurring within the month where we're transitioning away from the registration of the Learning Center. So I want to make sure you're aware that you will get the certificate whether you go to the Learning Center or not. If for some reason you were unable to find the PowerPoint, let us know. We'll get that to you. Again, use that survey. Um, use that education box that you're seeing right here on your screen for post-event. That's still going to be a post-event. So within the next couple of days, we'll get you more to complete. Again, if you have questions, we're going to send those out in an email format. We'll either send it back to you if it's really specific to you, or we'll share it as a full-on document. That then brings us to the end of the content. So on behalf of myself, Provider Outreach and Education, and Aline, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's event, and you may now disconnect.